So welcome to Bristow's Patent Case Review of the Year 2021. My name is Dominic Adair, I'm a partner at Bristow's and I'm joined today by Naomi Hazenberg and Charlie French, both senior associates in the Patent Litigation Department. And it's our pleasure to bring you this presentation of our case law review. It's a, an accompanying presentation to a hard copy publication and a soft copy publication that we produce each year. Um, I hope those of you watching this presentation will already have a copy. If you don't have a copy and would like one, please do send us an email and request one. Our email addresses will appear on the last slide of this presentation. Next slide, please. So here is the agenda for today's presentation. We're going to start with a small piece by me looking at what's changed in the court structure over the last 12 months and a few statistics. And then I'm going to hand over to Charlie and Naomi to give a, a personal selection of their favorite cases that form a top 10 countdown of 2021. Uh, Naomi's going to take mainly tech cases, Charlie uh, mainly life sciences cases. Next slide, please. So here's the court structure, and here is how things stood at the start of the year, 2021. There are really only two changes uh, during 2021 that are of note. Uh, the first change happened in February 2021, uh, which is where Mr. Justice Meller was uh, promoted to the High Court Patents Court bench. So we see James Meller appearing and being one of the two uh, technical patents court judges that here um, the heavy technical cases. Uh, so R Richard Mead being the other, um, and Mr. Justice Mead is judge in charge of the patents court. There's still a, a heavy reliance on deputies, and, uh, and, and we see that there, and we'll see it on uh, a, a coming slide as well, uh, how many cases um, have been heard by each judge. The other change to note is that also in February uh, 2021, later in the month, um, we had the retirement of Lord Justice Floyd from the Court of Appeal, leaving um, Lord Justice Lewis and Arnold and Burse uh, as the judges in the Court of Appeal, hearing mainly the patents court decisions, or the appeals from the patents court. Uh, it's a it's a pretty strong. Uh, uh, Court of Appeal on, on the patent side. Um, and even looking further up at the Supreme Court, we have Lord Kitchen there as, as a patent specialist. Um, so it's, you know, there's a, a, a great uh, expertise on patents cases across all levels of the court now. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so on to a few numbers. Uh, how many patent cases were there in 2021? The total number of decisions was 78. Um, so it's a busy year. 78 is about as high a number as we see. Um, it was, it's quite a bit up from last year. 2020 was around 60 something, 65, I think. Um, so a good number, a busy year for the courts. Um, and 22 of those 78 decisions were decisions from first instance trials, 17 of those in the Patents Court and five in the IPEC. Uh, 12 appeals were decided in 2021, and one of those was a Supreme Court decision. We'll come on to say some more about that. And it's common in this presentation for me to say that it's life sciences and telecoms cases that dominate uh, the court's list. Um, that was still true, but we did have some cases on other things um, that uh, it gave us a bit more interest. So, uh, for example, heat not burn uh, tobacco devices were, were there, and uh, even a case on seed drills, which we'll say some more about shortly. Next slide, please. So here's a graphical representation of that um, case output. You'll, you'll see that 2021 was indeed a good year. In fact, as good a year as we've had for a decade, not quite as good as the, as the record year in 20, uh, 2009, but really uh, a, a strong year. Next, next slide, please. So here's how busy the judges were. Now, look at the bottom of this slide at Mr. Justice Meller, uh, new to the bench and um, the busiest judge by quite some margin, hearing about 22 or 23 cases. Um, the reason for that, I think, is that Mr. Justice Mead, um, who's sort of in bronze medal position there, if, if you like, behind his honor Judge Hakon, was occupied for a lot of the time with the Optus and Apple litigation, um, a, a great amount of time spent by him on that. Um, and 
Mr. Justice Mellor, therefore, acting as a as a sort of sweep up of a lot of other cases and hearing a lot of the interim decisions, uh, which we'll see on the next slide, please. So here is the makeup of, of a lot of those interim hearings. You can see that the most popular topics at the bottom of the slide there are on confidentiality and jurisdiction, quite a few fights on that. Um, interesting also to note um, that there are about four decisions on expedition, uh, which was more popular than amendment, which had only three decisions or stay of proceedings on only two uh, decisions. So qu quite interesting interesting to see that makeup of, of cases there. Next slide, please. So in terms of outcomes, how did we get on? Uh, it, well, validity uh, was down a bit on, on the trend. You can see um, from the left-hand side of that graph that the, the trend tends to be that validity is a bit below 50%, but last year it was only about 30%, um, not a great year for patentees on validity, but a much better year for patentees on infringement where the, the, the line came up to the trend of about 75% um, patents being infringed. Now that's looking at validity and infringement separately there. We'll look at them together in a moment. But those, those numbers perhaps aren't surprising. Uh, the UK has always been a jurisdiction that, uh, that is tough on weak patents and um, on the generous side for, for infringement, um, assisted, of course, by now having a doctrine of equivalence. And speaking of the doctrine of equivalence, if we go to the next slide, we can show you what the breakdown of cases was. Now, this table shows, I think, every case that we've had since the doctrine came in in, in July 2017, where doctrine of equivalence has been considered by the court. And if you start looking from the top down of this table on the column that's second in from the right where it says infringement under doe you'll see that we started off in the early years having a lot of um, yeses a lot of infringements under the doctrine um, that's now changed if you look further down the table particularly last year in 2021 uh, quite a few no's appearing that's the orangey orangey red rose on this table so a bit more balance now under the doctrine of equivalence. It was um, uh, almost a prize every time you could say for, for the patentees, but tempered by the fact that if you look in the uh, far right column where it says, was the patent valid? Very often in the early days, the answer was no. Um, so we were getting infringement findings under the doctrine of equivalence, but the patent was held invalid. Um, now it's a little bit more balanced on that too. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the outcome where both validity and infringement were in suit, uh, the, the dominant outcome, unsurprisingly, thinking back to those trend line graphs, was the, uh, the outcome that the patent was invalid um, and infringed. That's the sort of dark green segment at the bottom of the pie chart. And if you look from 12 o'clock to about half past three, you'll see the best outcome for the patentee, valid and infringed, was in eight out of, I think, 30 patents uh, on this slide. So that's the, the figure there. Next slide, please. Final slide from me, um, looking at the granularity of the grounds of invalidity that comprise the challenges um, uh, made against patents. Now, the way this slide works is at the rear of the slide, um, uh, th there are the number of uh, counts pleaded on each particular ground of invalidity and in the foreground of the slide were the number of counts where those challenges were successful. So if we look in the middle of the slide at obviousness, we'll see that was pleaded 27 times in total across the year. 63% um, of those challenges succeeded um, in 17 cases. So it was a good year for obviousness challenges. Um, quite a few patents um, held invalid on that basis, um, which is unusual, actually. If you look back over the last few years, you don't often see um, inventive step attacks succeeding in, in that number. The other point to note um, is insufficiency. I think that's really quite surprising that out of the 15 attacks made on that basis, none of them succeeded. Um, perhaps even more surprising when we remember that insufficiency very commonly includes, at least in life sciences cases, um, the attack that the, um, the, 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 the patent wasn't plausible. 
So I think that's probably enough from me in terms of the statistics. I'm going to change the slide now and hand over to Charlie, who's going to start our countdown of top 10 cases. So Charlie, over to you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so our first case up this year is Claydon Yieldometer and Missouri. Uh, and as you will spot immediately, uh, this case is neither a life sciences nor a tech case, but is a short but very interesting IPEC decision relating to agricultural machinery from his honour Judge Hakon. And the case relates to patents to seed drilling apparatus of the type pulled by a tractor. The owner, a company called Claydon Yieldometer, brought an infringement claim under both patents uh, against one of its competitors, Missouri, in relation to Missouri's range of pro-till seed drills. Missouri then counterclaimed for invalidity for lack of novelty and obviousness. And what was particularly interesting in this case was Missouri's allegation of anticipation by prior use, which follows the case of Emson and Hoselock that we reported last year. The prototype seed drill towed by the tractor had been tested by Mr. Claydon in a private field bounded by a six foot hedge. Now the hedge itself was just next to a public footpath. That footpath was unmarked and unmaintained, but it also had three gaps in it. And Missouri argued that this meant a passerby could have seen the prototype in action, which deprived the claims of novelty. Now, the evidence was that, in fact, other than Mr. Claydon and his brother, there was never anyone present when the seed drill prototype was tested. Mr. Claydon gave evidence that he was aware of the public prior disclosure rules, having learned the hard way from a previous patent, and he would have prevented anyone who happened to be nearby from seeing the prototype. He said that from the tractor cab, he could have seen anyone in the vicinity before they could see what was happening in the field, and would have moved away so that they couldn't see any relevant details. However, his honour judge Hakon noted that he found it difficult to believe that nearly 20 years after the event, Mr. Claydon could accurately say with any certainty what he would have done, which would have depended on the exact circumstances and the impulse of the moment. His evidence as to exactly what he would have done also wasn't that clear. And the expert's evidence, which included photographs taken of the field through one of the gaps in the hedge near where Mr. Claydon tested the prototype, which you can see on the slide, suggested that an observer would have gle uh, gleaned key details of the machinery, including the features of the relevant claim. And his honour judge um, Hakon did not believe Mr. Claydon or his brother could have taken action to prevent the skilled person from seeing or inferring those features if they'd noticed a bypasser. The tracks in the soil also would have given away uh, relevant details about the claim features. So it was a very different situation to the garden hose in Emson and Hose Lock, which could be easily hidden. His Honour Judge Hakon expressed uh, sympathy with Mr. Claydon as he acknowledged that he had to test his prototype. And in fact, nobody had seen any of the testing. But unfortunately for him, in law, the prototype was made available to the public. And so the relevant claim lacked novelty because of the prior use. Uh, this feels like quite an unfair decision for poor Mr. Claydon and his company, given that there was clearly only a minute possibility that a skilled person could have looked through the gaps in the hedge from an unmaintained footpath. It does also beg the question of what the inventor was expected to do in this situation, given that he presumably couldn't have tested the seed drill indoors. Uh, and perhaps most interestingly, his honour Judge Hakon considered the role of technology in the law on prior use and suggested that the use of cameras with strong zoom lenses and even fleets of drones might be permitted to extend the reach of the observer if they could reasonably be expected to be equipped with that kind of technology when passing by uh, without planning the observation in advance. In this case, there, there was insufficient evidence that the skilled person would have had such technology to hand. And, and so the, the assessment proceeded on the basis of an observation by the naked eye. But the decision certainly suggests that the use of additional technology could be taken into account in future cases, uh, which opens up a whole new set of considerations. Okay, so my first case is a friend jurisdiction case. And in this case, um, 
Vestel, who make and sell TVs, uh, have been in license negotiations with Access Advance and Philips in relation to the patents that have been declared essential to the high efficiency video coding standard. It sued them both, claiming that they'd abused their dominant position by offering unacceptably high supra FRAND license rates and sought a determination of the applicable FRAND license terms. The first instance decision, which was a decision by His Honour Judge Hakon from December 2019, held that there was no jurisdiction to hear the claim. If the patents were ever asserted and they were found to be valid and essential, the relevant court would settle the FRAND terms and as, on, as Vestal would only ever be paying royalties on a FRAND basis, there would have been no damage suffered. He also rejected the argument that jurisdiction was established because the claim related to property within the jurisdiction. Prior to the appeal, Vestal made some pretty radical changes to its claim and they dropped all of the abuse uh, allegations but kept their FRAND declaration request. So the lead judgment uh, from the Court of Appeal was given by Lord Justice Burse, and although Vestal relied upon the same legal framework, its jurisdiction arguments were completely different to those that had been considered at first instance. So the first argument was that jurisdiction was conferred by Vestal's claim being a matter relating to tort. Vestal attempted to characterise their claim as uh, relating to the tort of patent infringement, However, the court noted that clearly traditional DNIs fell within the jurisdiction of the court, but Vestel's claim for a FRAND declaration in this case couldn't be characterised in the same way. The FRAND declarations didn't arise as a negative declaration relating to patent infringement. And the FRAND declarations from the Unwired Planet and Conversant case were based upon the patentee's undertaking to offer FRAND terms and the implementer's ability to enforce a contractual obligation in that regard. Vestal hadn't pleaded that they had any enforceable right to the FRAND license. So further difficulties were also highlighted in relation to Access Advance in this uh, part of the judgment, because as the pool administrator, they didn't even own the patents, uh, any of the patents concerned. The second gateway relied upon by Vestal uh, was that the claim related to property in the jurisdiction. Here, Vestal framed their FRAND declaration claim as one relating to the license for UK SEPs in the pool. They said that because this license would contain terms that needed to allow Vestal to avoid infringing the UK SEPs, the subject matter of the claim was property within the jurisdiction. This too was rejected and it was reiterated that the claim was at most asking the court to exercise its inherent jurisdiction to make a FRAND declaration in the absence of an assertion that it had a right to such license. The judge also rejected the proposition that the Pfizer and Hoffman LaRoche case on Arrow declarations established that the all was needed was uh, for, ju for jurisdiction to be conferred was that a useful purpose would have been served. In the, in the Pfizer case, the question would have been whether the claimant's product would have benefited from a complete defence to a legal claim. It didn't establish jurisdiction in the absence of any legal right or any legal claim. The importance of a legal standard against which to judge the declaration was noted, and uh, Lord Justice Burst said this was highlighted by the Supreme Court's comment in Unwired Planet that there was no such thing as a freestanding Fran, de Fran declaration. Uh, this case emphasised the need for any future Fran uh, declaratory action to be based upon a legal right. Um, still in the UK, no implementer has successfully brought a Fran action in the UK. Um, hope uh, might have been given by a comment uh, of Lord Justice Burst that if it had been showed that there was a legally enforceable right against a patentee or licensing agent to be offered a FRAND license and that that license would have included UK SEPs, it would be a claim that related to property within the jurisdiction and therefore the court would be able to hear the claim. Jurisdiction would be conferred in that regard. So some hope for implementers for the future. So next up, we have Illumina and Latvia MGI. And 2021 gave us both a first instance and court of appeal judgment in these proceedings. Illumina owns a number of patents relating to DNA sequencing technology, and in particular techniques involving combinations of nucleotides, linkers and labels. They brought an infringement claim against MGI, which sought to sell various sequencing systems in the UK 
uh, while MGI counterclaimed for invalidity. Now, these are complex decisions covering a number of issues, but we've picked out two points on validity, one that was only addressed in the Patents Court decision and one that was also addressed in the Court of Appeal. The first is on insufficiency, with MGI alleging that the claims encompassed ranges that weren't enabled over their full scope, relying on the Supreme Court decision in Regeneron and Chimab. Another interesting point was on inventive step. MGI argued that one of the patents was obvious on the basis that it claimed a mere collocation of two features. Now, at first instance, Mr. Justice Burse, as he then was, considered the Regeneron insufficiency principles and firstly confirmed that they were applicable to process claims as well as product claims, which is something many practitioners have been unsure about as Lord Briggs' eight principles from Regeneron are expressed by reference to product claims only. Mr. Justice Burse also helpfully reworded some of the principles to make them more applicable to process claims. Uh, and the judge then went on to provide some clarity on the difference between ranges that are relevant in the Regeneron sense and other ranges. He explained that an example of a range that is not relevant is a descriptive feature in a claim which can cover a variety of things, but where that variety does not significantly affect the utility of the claimed product or process in achieving its relevant purpose. And the relevant purpose is judged in all the circumstances including where appropriate by reference to the essence or the core of the invention. Now, the DNA sequencing technology that forms the basis of the patents in question is very complicated. So the judge came up with a rather simpler hypothetical patent to explain the concept further. And his hypothetical patent was one claiming a new type of teapot which was inventive and useful because it had a special spout shaped to prevent dripping. The claim to the teapot would include features of the spout shape, but may not limit the teapot to any particular material because that would be irrelevant to the invention. As a result, the claim would in include a range of teapots made of different materials. There would be some embodiments where the teapot would be functional, such as china, and somewhere it would be non-functional, such as chocolate. The claim would also be infringed at a later date, even if a teapot was made using a new inventive form of Pyrex glass, which hadn't been invented at the priority date. Mr. Justice Burse explained that the fact that the skilled person couldn't make the Pyrex teapot at the priority date doesn't matter from a sufficiency perspective, because the material of the teapot is not a relevant range in the Regeneron sense. Although it's crucial to the teapot's function, that's not the kind of relevance that Regeneron is referring to as it doesn't relate to the core inventive concept underlying the non-dripping feature. And he went on to explain that the, the correct test for sufficiency in that case would be whether a skilled person could select a suitable material for the teapot without undue burden. And that would clearly be the case here. Applying this to the rather more complicated technology in the case, Mr. Justice Burse found that none of the ranges identified by MGI in the Illumina claims were relevant ranges in the Regeneron sense, and the skilled person could select suitable components for use in the method without undue burden. Now, that point wasn't part of the appeal, uh, but one point that was important on appeal was the question of collocation. So this is the principle that one cannot validly claim a mere collocation of two features, each of which is individually old or obvious. Uh, establishing that there's a collocation of features can be useful for someone attempting to invalidate a patent as it's much easier to attack two separate inventions uh, for lack of novelty or inventive step than it is to attack a single combined invention. And here the argument related to one of the patents claiming nucleotides la labelled with dye compounds, which can be used in DNA sequencing, which is shown in a simplistic form in the diagram to the right. MGI had argued, and Mr Justice Burse agreed, that the claimed uh, linker nucleotide combination in one of the patents, so the green and orange bit uh, on the diagram, was obvious over one prior art document, and that the fluorescent dye, so the yellow part, was obvious over a separate prior art document. An MGI argued that the combination of the two features was a mere collocation and was therefore invalid for lack of inventive step, relying on case law including SABAF and MFI, 
uh, and various EPO decisions. However, Mr Justice Burse and the Court of Appeal were in agreement that unlike Sabaf, in which the two obvious features that were combined in the claim would have been regarded as being entirely functionally distinct, the evidence in this case was clear that the linker and the fluorescent dye would be viewed by the skilled person as being capable of interacting with each other. If they did interact, they wouldn't be useful for the intended purpose, DNA sequencing by synthesis, and a test would need to be performed to determine whether such an adverse interaction in fact took place. As a result, although there was in fact no synergistic effect or other interaction between the linker and the dye, the fact that there could have been an unwelcome interaction meant that the collocation principle did not apply. Uh, so why is this important? Well, the approach to collocation is interesting as it demonstrates that it's not necessary for two separate features to actually interact to avoid a finding of collocation. It's enough that they could interact. It also provides much needed guidance on Regeneron and Chimab, including Mr. Justice Burse's lovely teapot analogy. Um, when the Regeneron decision first came out, many people questioned whether the decision would be limited to its fairly unusual facts, or at least limited to product claims. But based on Mr. Justice Burse's judgment in Illumina, that doesn't appear to be the case. Okay, so next up is the action between Facebook and Voxer. And this started life as a revocation action concerning Voxer's patent. And in turn, Voxer alleged that the patent was infringed by the live broadcasting services on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, it's worth noting, Charlie, if we just pop to the next slide, it's worth noting that at the pre-trial review in this action, uh, Lord Justice Burse held that if a patentee is seeking to rely on the doctrine of equivalence, it must ple be pleaded. The minimum requirement is for the particulars of infringement to contain a statement that equivalence is relied upon. Voxer hadn't done so, but it was permitted on case management ground to introduce some doctrine of equivalence arguments in relation to two integers of the claim. In response, Facebook asserted that it had a Formstein defence, and the case was heard last April by Lord Justice Burr sitting in the High Court. The first uh, equivalence point, um, just on the next slide, is uh, related to the persistent storage uh, required in the claim. In the alleged infringement, uh, the data storage for the incoming message was in a temporary cache that was supported by network storage. As it turned out, the judge construed the claim on a normal basis to cover this storage because it allowed for later retrieval by the user, even if that was only a short time later when pausing or rewinding the live video. However, he went on to look at the equivalence argument and concluded that it wouldn't have infringed on this basis. He assumed the second act harvest question in Vox's favour, but the judge examined the first and third question in some detail. He said that to allow time shifting, the skilled person understood that there had to be some persistent storage and that that could only be done in the network or on the local device. Both of those options were described in the patent, but Voxer had chosen to claim only local storage and not network storage. With that deliberate choice, the skilled person would have thought it had been purposefully excluded and that strict compliance was essential. Alternatively, he said, one might look at it by saying that network storage made a material difference. Either way, on that integer, the doctrine of equivalence argument failed. The second doctrine of equivalence point related to the requirement for data to be stored at each hop through the network. There were several servers in um, Facebook's network that could but didn't store the message. And so on a normal construction, uh, there was no infringement. When looking at it uh, for equivalence, the judge concluded that for the first question, the skilled person would simply view the setup in Facebook's network as the necessary implementation of a very large scale network. And that for the second question, there was obvious functional equivalence. When he turned to look at the third question, an amendment was relevant, and Facebook argued that the approach on equivalence gave the same meaning to the words at each hop as at at least one hop, and that risked adding matter. Referring to the Akibia and Fibrogen case, the judge acknowledged that the skilled person would know the reason for the amendment, but found that the situation was different for added matter than an amendment due to the prior art. The judge felt that overall that was just a neutral factor 
and the question should be answered in Vox's favour and no strict compliance was needed. Although Obiter, he then went on to consider the application of Formstein in the UK and he commented that the Gillette approach should obviously apply to equivalents. When considering how that might apply, he favoured the Formstein approach of limiting the claim rather than rendering the claim invalid. He said it would have been harsh to invalidate a claim if it was valid on a normal construction. And it was also uh, the way that other EPC countries approached the question. So this uh, shows an interesting approach and limitation of the doctrine of equivalence and also a growing alignment of obiter views from judges uh, at first instance that Formstein should apply in the UK. So next up, we have Secretary of State for Health and Servier. This isn't really a patent case at all. It's actually a case about economic torts, but it is centred around Servier's activity regarding one of its patents. Servier developed and manufactured uh, perindopril, which was used for the treatment of high blood pressure and marketed by Servier under the name Coversal. Servier's patent for the alpha crystalline form of perindopril was granted by the EPO in 2004. And in the UK, Servier obtained an interim injunction against generics, but the patent was then held invalid for lack of novelty and inventive step in 2005, and that decision was upheld by the Court of Appeal. At the EPO, the opposition division upheld the patent in 2006, but it was later revoked by the TBA in 2009. Now, in the US, there's a doctrine of inequitable conduct by a patentee, sometimes called fraud on the patent office, which may arise uh, where a patentee knows the application being filed for a patent is specious, but pursues it anyway, in the hope that the reasons for the invalidity never come to light. We don't have an equivalent doctrine under English law. So the UK government, which funds the cost of drugs dispensed by the NHS in England, argued that Servier's actions amounted to the tort of causing economic loss by unlawful means. They allege that in obtaining, defending and enforcing the patent in the UK, Servier had practiced deceit on third parties, namely the EPO and the courts, with the intention of profiting at the expense of the NHS. And in particular, it was argued that Servier had made misrepresentations as to the novelty and inventive step of the alpha form of the perindopril salt that they knew to be false or that were made with reckless indifference as to their truth. The government alleged that as a result of Servier's deceit, generics entered the market later than they otherwise would have done, which meant that the NHS had to pay higher prices for perindopril and damages and interest of more than £200 million were sought from Servier, so the stakes were high. In 2017, uh, Mr Justice Roth in the High Court struck out the unlawful means claim, and the Court of Appeal dismissed the government's appeal in 2019, both holding that the 2007 House of Lords judgment in OBG and Allen had concluded that the so-called dealing requirement the element of the tort that requires the unlawful means to have affected the third party's freedom to deal with the claimant was a necessary element of the unlawful means tort and that this formed part of the ratio of the decision. And as both parties had agreed, neither the EPO nor the English courts had dealt with the government or the NHS uh, and there was no relationship between them. Uh, that wasn't the end of the story for the government though, as they appealed to the Supreme Court arguing that either the dealing requirement shouldn't be treated as forming part of the ratio of OBG and Allen, so the courts below were wrong to consider themselves bound by it, or that the Supreme Court should depart from OBG and Allen and dispense with the dealing requirement. So what happened? Uh, well, the status quo was maintained. An extended panel of seven Supreme Court judges unanimously dismissed the appeal and confirmed the strikeout of the unlawful mean claims against Servier, with Lord Hamblin giving the lead judgment and Lord Sales giving a short concurring judgment. And for anyone looking to refresh their knowledge of the various economic torts, the judgment is an interesting read and goes into the policy considerations behind the unlawful means tort, as well as covering cases going back to the 17th and 18th centuries including one involving cannon fire from a canoe against a rival trading ship. We don't have time to go into those details today, though, 
So the key point to take away for a patent practitioner is that the Supreme Court concluded that the dealing requirement was part of the ratio of OBG and Allen. They also concluded that the government had not been able to point to any injustice to demonstrate that this was an appropriate case for the Supreme Court to depart from OBG and Allen. Uh, so why is it important? Well, despite the government's best efforts, it continues to be the case in the UK that there is no equivalent to the US patent law doctrine of inequitable conduct under English law. Uh, there's no direct liability for committing a fraud on the patent office. And it seems that the door for arguing that any equivalent principles should apply, at least under the tort of unlawful means, is firmly shut. And this is important because, as Mr Justice Roth pointed out in his judgment at first instance, had the government's case been accepted and the dealing requirement removed from the tort of unlawful means, the implications for patent practice would have been very significant. Okay, so our next case is one uh, that we actually discussed last year when we looked at the first instance judgment. And uh, in this case, IPCOM's patent, uh, which covers a scheme for controlling access to a specific telecoms channel, was asserted against Vodafone's LTE network. Vodafone argued that its use of, use of the method was for the purpose of the MTPAS scheme uh, that asked network to give priority access to emergency services. It therefore uh, argued that it should be covered by the Crown Use Defence. The key issue uh, on the Crown Use Defence was the form of the authorisation needed. And I've included on the slide the request that's received by Vodafone and other networks. And it asks networks to give emergency responders, those users in classes 12, 13 and 14, a much higher likelihood of being able to make calls than normal customers. It's worth noting that it doesn't say use the scheme of any specific patent or use the method specified in any standard. At first instance, the judge uh, said that this was sufficient as the authorization identified the relevant act. Uh, on appeal, there were three possible interpretations canvassed uh, by the parties and also one by the controller. And um, Lord Justice Arnold gave the lead judgment uh, in this case, and he preferred option two. Either there had to be an express authorization to work the patent or an authorization to do a specific act where that necessarily infringed the patent. He disagreed that the judge had chosen the most natural interpretation, and he noted that the authorization must be to do acts in relation to a patented invention, and that the basis for the implied authorization was the necessity to infringe a particular patent. As we know, and as we've become used to, he gave a comprehensive review of the historic uh, legislation and earlier case law, and Lord Justice Arnold disagreed that earlier judicial opinion was divided. Rather, he said they all supported his interpretation. Another key factor was the ability to grant retrospective authorization, which would have been rendered redundant by the wider interpretation of the authorization needed. It also enabled the Crown to make informed decisions about giving authorization. This interpretation, he said, also preserved the usual commercial position where the burden rests with the party doing the acts and wasn't inconsistent with TRIPS. So uh, this uh, decision probably causes patentees to breathe a sigh of relief and restores the balance in relation to the Crown use defence, putting it back uh, to the previous um, slightly narrower scope than uh, had been changed at first instance. Uh, so case number four in our countdown is the cost decision in Neurim and Flynn and Milan. So Neurim held a patent for a pharmaceutical uh, formulations concerning melatonin for the treatment of a particular type of insomnia, part of a patent family that's been the subject of numerous decisions in the past couple of years. The opposition division had found the patent to be invalid in 2019, but Neurim appealed that decision, which had suspensive effect. A main action and PI action were then commenced against Milan in the UK. The PI uh, application was rejected by Mr Justice Marcus Smith in June 2020, but after an expedited trial in October 2020, the same judge found the patent valid and infringed in early December. However, Neurim didn't have long to celebrate as the patent was revoked at the EPO immediately afterwards. So this slide sets out a timeline of the events that took place in December 2020. 
Mr Justice Marcus Smith's decision finding the UK patent valid and infringed was handed down on the 4th of December. A form of order hearing uh, was then fixed for the 16th of December, at which point the parties in the court were aware that an expedited TBA hearing was scheduled to take place imminently. At the form of order hearing, unsurprisingly, costs were ordered in Neurim's favour as the winner of the UK case. And the orders were made by the judge, but never drawn up or sealed. Then at the TBA hearing on the 17th and 18th of December, the TBA indicated that the patent was invalid. Neurim then withdrew its appeal at the EPO with the effect that the opposition division decision from 2019 became final and the patent was revoked ab initio or ex trunc. The judge then made a further order on the 30th of December, revoking the 16th of December orders and holding the ring until a further hearing could take place, following which his judgment on consequential matters was handed down in March last year. And after considering relevant case law, including the Court of Appeal judgment and IP Common HTC, the judge found that he had jurisdiction to revisit the 16th of December orders and that such jurisdiction should be exercised, referring to the very special facts of the case, uh, including the proximity of time between the 16th of December orders and the TBA hearing, the fact that the 16th of, De um, of December orders were not drawn up, that it would be grossly unfair to Milan to contend that the 16th of December order should not be varied, and that it was at least implicit that the hearing on the 16th of December had been conducted on the basis that any orders made could and would be revisited if appropriate. But for the outcome of the EPO proceedings, it was uncontroversial that Neurim was the winner in the UK. However, in circumstances where success is a result in real life, the judge considered that the effect of the EPO proceedings was a relevant factor. He therefore considered Milan to be the overall winner, as the effect of the EPO proceedings was that the patent had been revoked. And so he awarded Milan its costs of the UK proceedings in a complete reversal of the 16th of December costs order. Well, this decision certainly raised some eyebrows. Uh, one question that arises is whether adjournment of UK trials may become more common where TBA decisions are pending. In his decision, Mr Justice Marcus Smith recognised why me, uh, neither party may have wanted an adjournment. Milan would have wanted two bites of the revocation cherry and Neurim would have wanted a final injunction in place as soon as possible. But the judgment certainly suggests that the matter should have been put before the English court to allow the court to engage in active case management. And the decision could be read in relatively narrow terms, given the very special facts, but it also raises what the judge calls a difficult hypothetical question regarding what would have happened uh, if the UK trial had gone ahead as it did, but with the TBA hearing not taking place until 2022, uh, which would have been the case without expedition. And although he noted that he was emphatically not deciding the point, his judgment doesn't rule out the possibility that Mylan might have been entitled to recover its costs following a much later TBA hearing. Now, <clears throat> just to keep us on our toes, the appeal decision in this case was handed down earlier this week. Uh, and the details of that decision strictly belong to Proti 2022. But very briefly, uh, the Court of Appeal, with Lord Justice Arnold giving the leading judgment, allowed Neurim's appeal on the costs issue. The Court of Appeal held that as the 16th of December orders hadn't been sealed, the Patents Court did have authority to vary the orders. Uh, although Lord Justice Arnold is very clear in his judgment that he is not deciding what the answer should be if the orders had been sealed. So he doesn't address the difficult hypothetical question that Mr Justice Marcus Smith raised. He said that Mr Justice Marcus Smith was right that the starting point under CPR 44.2 was that Milan should get its costs as the successful party following the outcome at the EPO. But the judge had been wrong not to go on to consider alternatives, having regard to all the relevant circumstances. And in fact, taking into account the fact that both parties were equally to blame for not keeping the court fully informed of the expedition of the EPO proceedings and therefore wasting costs, the right order in this case was that there should be no order um, as to costs. Um, so not the complete reversal of the costs order that Neuro may have hoped for, uh, and a number of questions left open for the future.
Okay, so up next is one of the judgments in the bust up between Optus and Apple. And as Dom said, this took up uh, a huge amount of court time last year, and there are actually seven judgments uh, relating to this case in total. But this one is a non-technical decision relating to whether Apple could be classified as an unwilling licensee. Having, fa having been found to infringe Optus's SEPs, Apple refused to give uh, an unconditional undertaking to enter into a frand license. But rather, to avoid an injunction, it gave what Mr Justice Mead described as a rather convoluted undertaking to take the court-determined FRAND licence, unless it was decided that Apple didn't need to give an undertaking to enforce Optus's Etsy FRAND undertaking, or it was decided that Apple should be injuncted in any event, even though it had given the undertaking. Optus argued that by doing this, Apple was seeking to obtain the benefit of its FRAND undertaking, and avoid an injunction without the corresponding burden of taking the frand license. Uh, and it fell to Mr Justice Mead to answer this question in September last year. So the first task for the judge was to interpret clause 6.1 of the Etsy IPR policy. And this requires SEP holders to irrevocably undertake to grant frand licenses. Uh, the key issue was whether the stipulation port or tree that this creates, uh, this clause creates, imposes any obligation on an implementer. The judge construed the clause under French law and considered detailed economic evidence whilst doing so. He said that the right interpretation of this clause is that anyone wanting to implement the Etsy standard must be entitled to a frand license on demand from an SEP holder who's given the Etsy undertaking and that implementer is entitled to have and take the FRAND license and operate under the license. However, he said the clause doesn't entitle an implementer to use the technology covered by an SEP, take the benefit of the SEP holder's FRAND undertaking, avoid being sued without the corresponding burden of taking the FRAND license. He then went on to look at timing. Uh, the judge rejected Optus's argument that the implementer had to commit to a FRAND license as soon as the patentee has indicated that it's unequivocally willing to grant a FRAND license. However, he said that all changes when there's a finding of infringement. At that point, the implementer can carry on practicing the invention, but only if it does so um, under a license. Following the procedure that's been adopted by the UK court, it will be required to give an undertaking to enter such a license uh, and failing that undertaking being given, there should be an injunction. And that is so regardless of the fact that the FRAND terms haven't yet been determined. The next thing that the judge looked at was Apple's allegation about abuse of a dominant process. Uh, he said it wasn't a complete answer to all competition law issues that Optus had committed to the FRAND term set by the court and Apple hadn't. He heard detailed submissions on paragraph 158 of the Supreme Court Unwired Planet Conversant decision, and also looked in detail at uh, Mr. Justice Burse, as he then was, decision at, at first instance in the Unwired Planet case, that on the facts of that case in question, there was no abuse. The judge said that there could still potentially be an abuse, even where the SEP holder is willing to be bound by the court's FRAN determination. The judge then proceeded on the assumption that Apple would succeed in establishing the alleged abuses and considered the availability of a final injunction in any event. He concluded that if there had been an abuse of a dominant position, an injunction would be withheld unless the court thought it was disproportionate to do so. And when making that decision, the court could consider factors such as the passage of time, any enduring prejudice, the implementer's attitude to taking the FRAND licence and the availability of alternative financial remedies. This was supported by the Supreme Court's reasoning that damages in lieu wouldn't be an adequate remedy and that withholding an injunction would frustrate the goals of the Etsy FRAND regime. The judge highlighted a key tool that the court had to ensure that any injunction was equitable and that was that it could prevent further abuses by putting the FRAND regime in place. So this judgment will have been music to the ears of SEP holders, signalling that the UK will continue to enforce an injunction if an implementer refuses to give an unqualified undertaking. And it's a very detailed decision, and you would have been forgiven for thinking that that was the end of the story. However, it was still possible for Lenovo to find one avenue not yet closed off to implementers looking to avoid an injunction. 
And after it had been found to infringe interdigital's patent, it argued in late 2021 in front of his honour Judge Hakon that it shouldn't be injuncted if it gave an, gave an unqualified undertaking to take the frowned licence set by a court, but in this instance, not the UK court, a court in a different jurisdiction. In fact, that undertaking hadn't actually been offered by Lenovo, but the judge noted that it highlighted that there were outstanding issues in relation to Clause 6.1 and a further trial took place uh, in January this year to look at that additional issue. There is one side note to take from this case, and that, that this is the judgment that led to the unfortunate series of events that culminated in the decision concerning the correct handling of draft judgments. This was followed by the recent case uh, where a press release was posted on a Chamber's website a few hours before the judgment uh, was handed down, and then a more recent case still about WhatsApp messages between colleagues prior to the judgment being handed down. All of these serve as an uncomfortable reminder of the necessary precautions and protective measures that should be put in place when dealing with draft judgments. Uh, our penultimate case this year is Fibrogen and Akibia. This was a complicated patent dispute involving six fibrogen patents relating to the use of inhibitors of an enzyme called hypoxia inducible factor prolyl hydroxylase or HRFPH uh, for treating various types of anemia. Akibia and Otsuka had brought revocation proceedings to clear the way for their products and Astellas, as the exclusive licensee of fibrogen brought a claim for threatened infringement. The case addressed a number of different patent issues from obviousness to insufficiency to infringement by equivalence and threatened indirect infringement of medical use claims, with Lord Justice Arnold uh, sitting in the Patents Court finding all the claims invalid in a judgment in 2020. Uh, but what's important for the discussion today is the finding of insufficiency. <clears throat> so it's easiest to follow the decision with the claim language in mind. You can see one of the medical use claims that were the focus of the appeal on the slide. Uh, features A and B are structural features marked in orange. The compounds must be heterocyclic carboxamide compounds selected from a specific group. Features C and E are functional features marked in turquoise. The inhibition of HIFPH activity and increasing endogenous erythropoietin or EPO. Features F and G are further functional features, also marked in turquoise, uh, setting out the disease to be treated, anemia associated with chronic kidney disease. Uh, now, this is a Swiss form claim. There was also a, uh, an EPC 2000 claim with the same structural and functional features, uh, but nothing turned on that in the case. At first instance, Lord Justice Arnold had held the claims to be insufficient for lack of plausibility and undue burden. And he reached those conclusions based on his construction of the claims as implicitly promising that substantially all compounds which satisfy the structural definitions in the claims, so A and B, will have the therapeutic efficacy. But the Court of Appeal, with Lord Justice Burst giving the leading judgment, disagreed. Lord, Just, um, Lord Justice Burr set out a new structured three-step approach for assessing plausibility or reasonable prediction, as he preferred to call it. The first part of the test is to identify what it is that falls within the scope of the claimed class. The next step is to determine what it means to say that the invention works. So what is it for? And the third step is to ask whether it's possible to make a reasonable prediction that the invention will work with substantially everything falling within the scope of the claim. And he explained that there are two types of functional feature and they can fall either within step one, the definition of the scope of the claim, or step two, the determination of what the invention is for or what it means to say that the invention works. And approaching step one of the test for the claim shown on the slide, it was manifest that what falls within the scope of the claim, a compound satisfying both the structural, structural features A and B, so the particular uh, heterocyclic carboxamides, and also functional features C and E, the inhibition of HIFPH and increasing endogenous EPO, 
which can be tested with appropriate in vitro and in vivo assays. That was consistent with the specification and the judge had made an error of principle and approach by not making a, a finding to that effect. On step two, determining what it means to say that the invention works, it was clear that working in this case means treating chronic kidney disease anemia, features F, um, F and G. Moving on to step three, it was plausible that compounds satisfying structural features A and B and functional features C and E would be useful to treat chronic kidney disease anemia. So the claims were plausible. On undue burden, Lord Justice Arnold had applied a threshold that required the skilled person to be able to identify substantially all compounds covered by the claim without undue burden. And the Court of Appeal also disagreed with this approach. No functional language could ever satisfy such a test because by definition, a functional feature is capable of covering something which has not been invented yet. And having reviewed the UK and EPO case law and the German dipeptidylpeptidase inhibitors case, Lord Justice Burr said that the appropriate question is instead whether it's possible to perform the invention across the scope of the claim without undue effort. And he broke that down into two elements. Firstly, can the skilled person identify some compounds beyond those identified in the patent, which are within the claimed class and therefore likely to have therapeutic efficacy without undue burden? And secondly, can the skilled person work substantially anywhere within the whole claim? And that part requires the skilled person, uh, given any sensible compound within the structural class, to be able to apply the tests without undue burden and work out if it is a claimed compound. Applying step one, the patent provided example compounds and also the in vitro and in vivo tests needed to identify whether other compounds had the step one functional features. The court below had found that although it would be a great deal of work, the skilled person would be able to find some compounds which were effective through routine work. Applying step two, Although there was evidence that a significant number of compounds within the structural class as a whole would not work due to issues with pharmacokinetics, side effects or difficulties making them, many of these issues could be avoided by the skilled person making sensible choices. There was also no evidence that any of the issues related to a specific region of the scope of the claim. These were generic issues that applied across the board. Taking that into account, there was no issue of undue burden for the claims in this case. And the fact that the overall structural class is staggeringly large, as Lord Justice Arnold had noted, is not relevant to the application of the undue burden test. So why is this important? Well, Lord Justice Burst took a very different approach to the construction of claims with functional features when compared to Lord Justice Arnold in the Patents Court and set out this new three-step approach for plausibility, as well as a new name, reasonable prediction. Lord Justice Burr's two-step test for undue burden really follows the approach to construction and plausibility that he took. But again, it provides a useful structure and guidance for assessing undue burden for other claims with functional features. The decision is obviously good news for patentees, and suggest a, um, an, a more lenient approach for functional claims, provided that examples of compounds within the claims scope are provided and appropriate tests can be applied to identify further compounds meeting the functional features without undue burden. And so on to our final case, and this is the Court of Appeals consideration of the approach to AI inventions. Um, and by now, I imagine we're all fairly familiar with the facts of this case, but just a quick recap. Dr. Teller had applied for two patents, but he'd stated that he wasn't the inventor. Rather, he said the inventor was his AI machine called Dabus, but that he'd acquired the right to apply for the patent by owning Dabus and therefore being the default owner of any IP it produced. He stated that he couldn't claim inventorship himself because that would have been fundamentally wrong and would have weakened the moral justification for rewarding innovation. The IPO rejected these contentions and the decision on the behalf of the controller was that Dabus couldn't be regarded as the inventor as it wasn't a natural person and that the inevitable consequence was that the right to apply could not have been transferred to Dr. Teller. 
as Dr. Teller wasn't entitled to the grant of the patent, the applications were deemed to be withdrawn. The appeal from this decision was heard by Mr. Justice Marcus Smith, who looked in detail at sections 7 and 13 of the Patents Act, and he concluded that a patent could only be granted to a person, the holder of the patent must be a person, that the inventor had to be a natural person, and the result is that Dr. Taller couldn't be entitled to the grant of a patent by an enactment of law or an agreement before the invention was made, or as the inventor's successor in title, because Davis lacked the ability to transfer property and convey the right to apply to Dr. Taller. Without an application by the inventor or a person to whom the right to apply had been transferred, there could be no patent. So this was appealed and it was heard by the Court of Appeal last July and in September the judgment was handed down and there was some broad agreement on whether or not Davis could be an inventor but there was also a divergence of opinion between Lord Justice Burse and Lord Justice Arnold concerning section 13 and the statement as to the inventor's identity and any derivation of title. We'll start by looking at Lord Justice Burse's judgment, and he reviewed the historic legislation and the Banks Committee report that led to the changes in the 77 Act. He concluded that as the actual divisor had to be a person, so by definition did the inventor. Moving on to section 13, he found that all that is required for the applicant is to identify who they believe is the inventor in good faith. He said, provided that the applicant had stated their genuine belief, section 13.2a would be satisfied. He said a hypothetical situation was that it was possible that an applicant could say in good faith that they couldn't identify an inventor. And as long as there was a coherent explanation for why that wasn't doable, he would have been surprised if that would prejudice their application. The section, he said, doesn't impose a higher burden for the applicant than just stating their genuine belief. When turning to look at section 13.2b, he considered that the purpose of providing the information was not to enable the controller to examine the right to grant. The judge had been wrong to think that in granting the patent there was any ratification of the applicant's right to be entitled to the grant of the patent. The purpose of the section uh, was rather just to give the controller information to be made public and Lord Justice Burr said that the judge's reasoning would turn the clock back to the provisions of the 49 Act and ignore the purpose of the change in the legislation, which was to relieve the controller of the obligation to examine in detail the right to grant. Looking at section 7.2, Lord Justice Burr commented that the judge had been wrong to view subsections B and C as involving a transfer of rights. Under subsection B, the applicant could be the first owner. He highlighted the case where an employer applies in relation to an invention made by an employee in the course of their normal duties. When setting out what he considered to be the right response to Dr. Taller's statement of inventorship, Lord Justice Burse noted that the statement had been filed in time and had identified who Dr. Taller believed was the inventor. It didn't identify a person because Dr. Taller didn't believe there was a human invention. And there was also no suggestion that the statement wasn't an honest reflection of Dr. Taller's belief. He also said uh, that Dr. Taller had given and stated the manner in which he believed that he derived his right to apply, so that could also have been included in the register. All of that meant uh, that Dr. Taller had satisfied uh, Section 13.2 uh, in the eyes of Lord Justice Burse, and he said the applications shouldn't have been deemed to be withdrawn. Lord Justice Arnold didn't agree with that and he approached the issue differently. First, he did agree that only a person uh, could be an inventor and consequently Davis didn't qualify as an inventor. Next, he considered whether Dr. Taller was entitled to apply under Section 7.2b. There is, he explained, no property in information. The property referred to in this section was the right to apply for a patent in relation to an invention. And he also drew attention to section 39.1, which exemplified how someone other than the patent, other than the inventor, would be entitled to apply under section 7.2b. He said that's the section that gives effect to the legal right of someone other than the inventor to apply for a patent. He then turned to the doctrine of accession 
and, and that was relied upon by Dr. Taller. He noted that that allowed the owner of pre-existing tangible property to own any newly produced tangible property, so an apple from an apple tree. However, he said that logic did not translate to any intangible property that was produced. When applying that all to Dr. Taller's position, Lord Justice Arnold commented that Dr. Taller's uh, argument was based on the supposition that a machine could have been the inventor. And because that wasn't the case, there was no basis for a person to stand in place as Dr. Taller had suggested. As a result, Dr. Taller was not entitled to apply for the patents. Looking at what the right course of action would have been in respect to these applications, he agreed with Lord Justice Burst that section 13.2 didn't enable the controller to investigate or ratify the correctness of the answers provided. He also agreed that if the applicant complies with the requirement to identify the person that he believes to be in the inventor, and also the way that they derived the right to apply, the application must proceed. However, it couldn't be ignored that the consequence of not complying with the requirement for section 13.2b was that the application must be deemed to be withdrawn. The same approach, he says, has to apply to section 13.2a. If the statement isn't filed in time or is defective on its face, the same fate awaits. As no person was identified as the inventor and it was legally impossible for Dabas to be the inventor, Dr. Taller's form was deficient on face value. He had also failed on face value to explain the derivation of his right to apply. And therefore, Lord Justice Arnold said that the inevitable consequence of these failures was that the applications should be deemed to be withdrawn. So in this case, it fell to Lady Justice Lang to, uh, to be the um, deciding uh, vote, and she agreed with Lord Justice Arnold. And overall, Lord Justice, uh, uh, the Court of Appeal dismissed Dr. Taller's appeal. So this clarifies the position on AI inventions, and now we all know that it's not possible under the current legislation to name a machine as the inventor and have those applications proceed. Uh, we understand that this is uh, being appealed to the Supreme Court. Um, the UK Court is in line with the decisions from the EPO and the USPTO, although those are also under appeal. But it's interesting to note that in South Africa and Australia, the decisions have gone in favour of Dr. Taller. There was also last year a second consultation um, from the UK IPO in relation to AI inventions. This time it focused on the broader question of whether any rights should be allowed where AI had been part of the inventing process. It asked respondents to give their views on whether the legislation needed changing. Feed, the feedback for the, from this consultation is being analysed, so it's another case of watch this space. And that is the end of our top 10 cases. Thanks, Naomi. I really enjoyed that selection. I hope you, the listener, also enjoyed it. We can't obviously take questions um, live, as it were, but we would be very keen to hear from you. Um, if you have any questions on the cases or if you have any comments or feedback on the presentation, please do drop us a line on the email address, as you can see on this last slide. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and we look forward to presenting to you again next year. Goodbye.